All right. So when you download the SDK, you're going to get this stuff here. Um, I'm actually going to point you to one of my favorite places to go, which is the docs folder. It has both uh, a, kind of an HTML style general documentation that Beeman's put together. Uh, it also has the Java docs in here, which are really valuable if you want to go and figure out what everything does. So I'm not going to dig too much into that, other than to say when you first download this and, uh, and you put it somewhere, um, one good thing to look at, well, first of all, you got to make sure you're running the right uh, Java. If you're running Java 8, you also have to install the JCE security policies. Um, and there is information here about how to do that. Uh, I think it's in the, uh, it's on one of these installs here. So install Debian, I think is what it is. Um, but the other one that is good to look at is key management, depending on how secure you want to be. This is a good document here that talks about how to spin up the public and private keys. So the public key for the swirl and the private key for each of the nodes in the swirl. Um, and this is generated, um, actually I can just show you here. If we go into this key folder here, and we actually take a look at, uh, we'll get SH here, and see if I can make this one bigger. No, you might want to go bigger. All right, well, in here it has hard coded in the names of the keys you want to create, or you can put the names in this uh, names file here called names.txt. These names just have to correspond with the names of the nodes. And if you look at the config file, you can see in here that you've got this, addre this address book here, which is an array of addresses. This is kind of the short name, and this is the name right there, the full name. And as long as the keys match the name, everything will start up okay. So this is usually what I do is I go into data, go to keys, and then I do a generate, and right now the default is to generate out of Carol and Dave. So I'm going to let it go through its whole process. Uh, it's going to do all of its adding certificates, and you'll see we now have private Alice, private Bob, public in there. And this is uh, slightly more secure, actually the Technically, it's quite a bit more secure than if you were to just run the app by itself. If you run it by itself, the app tries to deterministically create these keys in memory. Um, and anytime you deterministically create keys, uh, you're, you're creating a vulnerability. So in this case, we did create four keys. We have three, uh, I'm sorry, five keys, four private keys, and one public key. And what you would do is as you spin this up on multiple nodes, for each node, you would copy the private key for that node plus the public key. Um, and everybody gets a copy of that public key, and each node only gets their private key. So you'd use one node to generate the keys, and then you'd distribute those keys appropriately, and then everybody's talking and is happy. So even now, if I back out of this and I go, we take a look here, which app do we have? Stat, stat demo? I'm gonna turn off stats demo and we're going to go with the Hello Swirl demo. I know that's never exciting, but I just want to show that uh, we'll get a different method here. I do Java jar swirls, and then when it starts up, you'll see here that it's actually using the keys. Well, can't see now, but here, let me take this. You'll see that it's actually using the keys that we generated from the key folder. If you didn't, it would actually tell you that you don't have keys in that folder and it's deterministically creating them for you. So that's always my first step. Whenever, even if I'm testing, I just get in the habit of generating my keys. Um, and it also gets rid of that annoying message that uh, if you're a developer, you probably get annoyed by little things like that. You want to make all your warnings go away. So, uh, so that's one of the things I do. I start out with the keys. Let's go ahead and that process. All right. If you look at the structure here, I'll just look at the root here. We've got this config text that we looked at, that we're looking at you right now in here. Uh, we've got the swirls jar, which is the actual platform that runs. We've got your source code, which is where you write everything. 
your docs and your data. Your data is where your apps are deployed to, so you'll see here that we've got uh, seven apps deployed here, and your keys, and then you have your repos for the app and platform and libraries for all the dependencies. Um, I, I generally don't touch those, uh, or the FC template right here, which is the file system template, the file chunk templates. Um, I don't mess with those. I usually just play with the apps folder, because um, when I publish, that's where it gets published too. So that's the general structure of, uh, of what we're doing here. Uh, man, this is going to bug me. There's got to be a way to. There we go. I did something. Wow. Is that better? Yes. Okay. We'll go with that. Much good. Okay. So now let's hop into the source. Um, what I generally do here is I just go in and uh, create a couple directories. So the new directory, and I'm just going to call this SLC demo. And I'm going to create another new directory in here. And I'm going to call this my source folder. And uh, open up, there we go. It's probably not worth writing your POM file from scratch, so I just usually grab another POM file and I just go copy, come in here and go paste. OK. And then I go in here and I just edit the app name, the group ID, and the artifact ID. So in this case, we'll just call it SLC demo. And uh, you know, let's make this bigger too so you can see that. There we go. Save that. And then I'm going to go into the root palm here. And I'm actually going to create a new module and also call it SLC demo. And one of the reasons I love IntelliJ, it's like, hey, you changed something in Maven. Let's go ahead and import those changes. So I'm going to go ahead and import that, and it now recognizes my project as a Maven project in this, uh, or I should say a module in this project. All right. So this is all the set of stuff to get started on. This, to me, is, is the easy part of it that's kind of a pain, and we try to automate that most of the time. I'm going to go ahead here, and I'm going to say I'm going to create a new Java class. I like to start with the state class. Um, it's a little bit easier to start with state than it is to start with main. So I'm just going to say SLC demo state. And because this is a swirls project, I'm going to take the swirl, the swirl, the spell right, state. You'll notice we have two different state classes to implement. Um, the first one, the idea with it is that uh, it's going to stream to you all of the consensus transactions first. And when it's done streaming all the consensus tra transactions, it's then going to stream all of the non-consensus transactions. Um, and then it's going to create a copy of itself and do it all over again. The swirl state 2, actually, uh, it, it only streams it once. Uh, as non-consensus, and then again, once it's reached consensus. So this is uh, just depends on what type of uh, platform you're building. If you're if if you're okay uh, receiving non-consensus transactions, and you want to kind of maintain it over a long period of time, this world state too is sufficient. I'm going to do this world state here. Um, this is kind of the uh, the default one, and that's the one that I like to use. Um, and I can explain a little bit why in use cases later. All right, so uh, another reason I like IntelliJ is world state. It's popping up this little er error notification here saying something's wrong. Oh, it's an implemented class, so I need to implement the methods. So I'm just going to do that, and you'll see all these fun methods here that just get nice and implemented for me. Okay, can you expand the side of that too, please? Oh, yes. Thanks for reminding me. There we go. Oh, it's going to ask me which JDK to use. Hey, let's go ahead and do Java 9. That might be a good idea to set the project's JDK. That always helps. All right. So now we've got all of these methods as part of this class. Um, and it straightforward. That gets called once when the class is initialized. We get address book copy. Notice it's not returning anything. So we have to do something there. Copy from is also not doing anything, uh, but this is used as part of the, the copy method of 
figuring out which class is coming next. So let me explain real quick how this works from a flow perspective. We'll see it here in just a second in the main class. But in our main class, we're going to create transactions and drop them into the Swirls network. It's going to go through the consensus process, and then every node is going to receive those transactions through this handle transaction method. Um, the network or the or the uh, ledger, the distributed ledger, is going to hand back transactions, like I said before, consensus order first, or those that have reached consensus first, and they're going to be received in their consensus order. Um, and then after that's going to hand us all the non-consensus transactions until everything has been handed in. And once that's happened, then it's going to create a new state class and copy over everything that we persist in this state class over to the new state class. So um, when we create these swirl states, they're constantly being copied. Um, and the platform is doing that for us. And it's going to stream in new transactions. When it runs out of transactions, or here's the no more transactions method, it's going to call that method and say, I'm done with the transactions. And then it's going to copy everything that's in this state over to the new state. And it's up to us to implement what copy looks like. It's up to us to implement how do we handle transactions, or what do we do when there are no more transactions. So we get to define all that stuff. Let me get rid of this stuff. I don't like it. <clears throat> Another thing that's not part of the uh, not part of the um, abstract class uh, or the uh, interface is that we want to add uh, synchronize to all of these methods. So it allows there not to be any uh, any race conditions or blocking or anything going on there. Uh, see which one does not get synchronized. One of them doesn't get synchronized. I can't remember which one. Uh, here, let's go look at Hello Swirl and we'll see here for sure. Um, Synchronize, synchronize, synchronize. No more transactions. That's right. Yeah, so all the rest of these are going to be synchronized. Handle transaction. And you'll see if you start playing with the SDK, uh, you'll notice that uh, things don't work the way you expect them to work if you don't put that synchronized in there. All right. So this is our base state. We basically have defined what our state is. And so your state is, is this is where you can persist whatever you want to persist in memory. This is where you can write things to the file system. This is where you can write things to the database. Um, so this is really what we're doing here is we're synchronizing this state across all of the nodes in the network. Um, and all the logic that goes into managing that state happens here in the state class. So I'm not going to go, uh, I'm not going to jump into the rest of this here, but let's go ahead and now that we've created a state, let's go ahead and create a main class. SLC demo main. And then we're going to say implement swirl main, there we go, and it's going to pop up with this little notification saying, hey, there's all these methods you haven't implemented. Go ahead and implement those. Could you increase the file size? Thanks for reminding me again. You'll probably have to remind me every single time. That's fine. <laughs> so a few things that you're going to want to build here first is um, uh, we have the platform itself. And we also have your self ID. So this is how we reference the node is with your self ID. So when you initialize it, you can say platform is equal to. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's do this right, shall we? This platform is equal to platform, and this dot self ID is equal to. Here it's saying long L, but that's really your ID. We're going to say self ID. All right, ID. There. So we basically initialized this platform. This platform, this platform. All right. Um, also, you'll notice that we probably need a main in here. So we're going to say uh, public static void main. And uh, we're going to do. Good old 
string args. And then what we're going to do is uh, platform the browser. I'm trying to remember here. Maybe it's browser dot. Man, there we go. Ah. Sorry, I'm trying to do this all off the top of my head. So. What am I missing here? String main args. Oh, I want to spell string there. There we go. All right. So this is your basic main right here. We've got our, our main here that now says this is a runnable class. It's our static uh, class that is the thing that runs. This also launches the browser for, um, for the Swirls uh, platform. So Swirls has its own browser. This is, this is what you see that pops up as the, um, uh, the stats screen if you have a GUI running on your platform. If you do not have a GUI running, so if you're, uh, if you're, serve, if you're in a server environment, for example, and you don't have any user interface, uh, then that would not pop up. It would still run just fine. It's not a config thing. It's nothing you can do to kind of pull it out. If there's a GUI, the app detects the GUI and launches that browser. If there's not a GUI, it detects that there's not a GUI, and it does not launch that. So we get a lot of questions about, how do I make that thing go away, or how do I run this in a server environment? And the answer to that is that uh, you just run it, and it works. All right, so we've got our main, which makes it runnable. Uh, we've got our init, which is the uh, initializing everything. We've got our run, and this is where all the magic happens. Let me come in here, and I'm going to say uh, turn new. Oops. That's all links me. There we go. So we're going to return a new state there when we get the new state. And then we've got this thing here. So um, if you're familiar with how Ashgraph works, it um, it takes all the transactions it receives during the gossip process and packages them into something called an event. And then that event is what gets gossiped out in the future. So you can think of, uh, of a node basically collecting transactions, either locally or through gossip, then packaging that into an event, and then sending that off to the rest of the world so the rest of the world knows uh, that those transactions exist. Um, when this pre -event, in this pre-event, you can actually do a lot of things here where you can grab all those transactions and do whatever you want with those transactions before you package them into an, into an event. A good example of that would be if you've got some, say you've got a member list and only certain members are allowed to submit transactions and they have to sign the transactions before they send it through the API. And what you're gonna do is validate that those transactions are authorized to be dropped in to an event and passed in through the platform. So this is kind of that last little catch-all to do any types of validation or any other types of logic you want to do on the transactions before they go into the event. And then obviously run is where you do all your magic. So in this case, you know, we can just do like a, a system out. Um, actually, let's just do this. Since we've got it here, it's dot society. There we go. And then we do something here, say we do uh, platform dot create transaction, and then we don't have anything in there right now, but we can drop stuff into there. And uh, say, for example, we want to take, um, I'll just say a string. Uh, TX string equals try to do. And then we want to take a byte array, because keep in mind that a transaction is a byte array, which we call a transaction. And we're going to take uh, TX string get bytes. And we're going to do standard character set. By the way, Java is not my first language. I'm more of a, a Python Rust guy. So if I make any mistakes along the way, please forgive me. There we go. So that would be a standard example of how to pass in a transaction. You would do whatever you're doing at the runtime, 
this is where you're going to bootstrap the APIs. You're going to have submodules uh, that are going to define what your API, your API looks like. People are going to pass that information in. You're going to take that information, convert them into byte arrays. Each transaction is just a byte array. So there's nothing uh, magical about it. And then you're going to pass that byte array to create transactions. So what we see a lot of people do is they'll do stuff like, I'm just going to give this as an example, that they're going to say, okay, I'm going to create a, a JSON stream. I'm going to have the you know, client ID. Oops. Uh, client ID is you know whatever that is. And then we're going to say message is whatever it is. And then they're going to go on and, and build out this this JSON object, and they will they will serialize it or do whatever they need to do to build that JSON object in the same way, convert it to a byte array, and then drop it into create transaction. And on the other side, they're going to take that and convert that back into a JSON object, and then handle that in whatever same way they're going to handle it. I'm showing it as a string here. Ignore that. Just you could be using JSON or something like that, where you're creating uh, classes that handle incoming transactions and build logical structures that. Uh, can be used, um, and then you're just going to take that and convert that into a byte array, however that works for you, and pass that in. So there are other ways to do this. I mean, you can prep this with, uh, uh, you know, like a protobuf protocol or something like something that, uh, or some type of message pack or something like that that maybe is more uh, concise than just passing in strings. Up to you how you want to do it, as long as it ends up as a byte array before it gets passed in as a, as a transaction. Once this is dumped in as a transaction, it's going to go through, reach consensus, and pop back through on this handle transaction. And you can see here that there is something here called bytes. I'm just going to change that to transaction. And then you, you get to handle that transaction however you want. So if you wanted to do, say, um, we'll just say, uh, I don't know. String result is equal to new string transaction and there we go. And then you can do whatever you want to do with that. So I basically just sped walk through the fundamentals of how to set up your project, how things flow through the, the platform, um, and then it's up to you how you want to handle either the persistence of that state, what is that synchronized state you want to share across all of the nodes, and how do you want to receive transactions and handle the state outside of that state class. Any questions so far? I have a question. Um, sure. And so could you, could you do a little bit of uh, work in the handle transaction method? Like conditionally look at the consensus. If if consensus has been reached, then do this, else do something else. Just kind of down yeah. Down. Well, so uh, there's a lot of things we can look at here, but let me see. Um, I'm trying to think of what would probably be the best, probably the game demo. And uh, I'm, I'll make this bigger here in a sec. But I'm going to get down to the handle transaction because there's a lot of stuff going on in the game demo. But here we go. All right, so uh, this one actually doesn't do a whole lot of if consensus. Oh, you know why? Because in a game demo, you don't care. It's kind of like UDP, send and forget, uh, versus TCP, where you got the acknowledgment. So in this case, we're basically saying, yeah, this is just uh, send it and act on it. Uh, so that's probably not the best one. Let's see here. Conditional consensus, doesn't it? Yeah, I think so. I think most of them do. Uh, I think the game demo is the yeah, game demo is the exception actually. Yeah, so you can see here uh, if consensus isn't reached or consensus length is less than three, then you just return. And then. If those, all these conditions are met, then it moves on to handling the, the trading process and storing this as uh, an exchange, if you will. So that's a, that's a good point here. If you look at is consensus, so you'll notice that when a transaction comes in, he renamed 
uh, each of the of the parameters here, but you've got long ID, Boolean is, is consensus. You get this timestamp, which by the way, that is the fair ordered timestamp if it has reached consensus. Um, and then you have your byte array, which is the actual transaction. Um, and then you have the address of the source of the transaction. And so you can use all of this information to help you identify um, whatever logic you want to apply to that. Okay. Yeah, so is consensus you got to check, transaction length you're going to want to check. Any other questions? So, so Ken, uh, transaction length is just the length of the byte array? Correct. Okay. Yep. Okay, so got a microphone up here. If any of you would like to come up here and ask questions, and can you see me, Ken? I can. Okay, so if you want to come reveal yourself to Ken and speak into the microphone so everyone can hear you, uh, please come on up. Do you have any questions? Just as a follow-up to that, are there good examples in the doc or kind of lead-ins where I could analyze like the pros and cons of doing a private versus a public net? Because I really, I mean, it's a lot of a lot of information in a short amount of time, and I realize that I don't even quite know how to understand it yet. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a tricky one, and it'll probably it, there's nothing there right now. It's all if you join our Discord channel, hashcraft.com forward slash Discord. That's where all the developers live. Um, everybody will help you evaluate your use cases. Um, I'll tell you, most use cases do really well in the public network but I'm also very much involved in the enterprise and telecom space specifically, and there are a handful of use cases that are ideal for permission network. Anytime you have uh, enterprises in, integrated with each other and they don't want the rest of the world to see, that's a pretty good use case for a private network. Okay, thank you. Thank you, my name is Matt. Um, hey, Matt. Following up on what you last time was there for enterprise private side, how many, and I apologize, I'm, I'm not a coder, so I only got okay. half of your last pre your presentation. Basically, I got half, right? Um, so, how many nodes are required to get consent uh, consensus? How many different pieces do you need? Because what I'm looking at, and what my company is looking at developing potentially, will start out very small, but it does need to be packed. Um, yep. And so, it may only be five nodes. At the beginning, it may be 25 nodes a year later. Yep. I, and now, at what point do I need to have a huge network, or is it something that I may be able to piggyback on the public side and use those nodes to acquire consensus? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So um, mathematically, the minimum you're going to need is three, because you got to have two thirds uh, consent for consensus to happen. So mathematically, the minimum is three. In all of our demos, we do four, which for all intents and purposes is the same. Um, but you can go down to three if you need to, but I would recommend going as high as you can go. Five is fine. Um, if you look at the latest white paper that Lehman put out that's on the hedera-hashcraft.com website, or if you just go to hashcraft.com, you'll see the most recent white paper, and it actually has some graphs about performance. So, how many nodes over distribution and what type of uh, performance metrics they're getting. So it sounds like you're probably not going to get too high into it, but you know, 40 is kind of the optimum level. So if, if you're happy with 40 being a, a good sized network, uh, that's where you're probably going to get some of the best performance, uh, depending obviously on, on your configuration. You know, it just depends on what your app is doing. Cool. Thanks. Ken, supposing Supposing we have an application that implements a dozen or two dozen, maybe a hundred nodes, what can we expect as like a ballpark estimate for the time to reach consensus? So it depends, there's a lot of factors here. So the first one is the distribution of your nodes, how far apart all of, are all of your nodes. The next one is how many nodes do you have, because just the laws of physics require us to gossip, and that gossip takes time, the more nodes you have. Um, the other one is your transaction size. Um, and then the other one is what type of business logic do you have that's being performed on those transactions. So um, I'll just give you kind of what we've researched and what we've published. We've got 100 byte transactions over 40 nodes that are distributed around the world. So we've got global distribution. Um, and we were getting anywhere from five to seven seconds of fi uh, finality at about 250,000 transactions a second. 
and 100 bytes because that's the size of a cryptocurrency transaction. That's probably going to be the majority of our transactions on the public network. Now, if you've got a, uh, a smaller distribution, so say you've got uh, uh, 50 nodes or 100 nodes in Utah, you probably could outperform the 40 nodes in the world because you don't have all the network latency. Actually, you might be closer to about the same four or five seconds. Um, I've done some kind of preliminary architecture, reference architecture for game developers, because we've got a game developer in our community who's actually building on the permission network. Um, and there are a number of cool optimization tricks you can do that could speed up the, the entire consensus process. And we've got it down to sub one second consensus over 10 nodes that are chosen when the game launches. So if you've got 50 people playing, it chooses 10 people with the lowest latency around uh, to the people around them and stands them up as nodes. And then those nodes become kind of the hubs to the other players around them. They reach consensus amongst each other and broadcast back out to the rest of the players. So you can have hundreds of players in the game, and of those hundreds of players, you've got 10 nodes that are reaching consensus, and those nodes are randomly chosen every time you start up a game, the player game. And those were getting down to in the milliseconds. Okay, that's kind of what I, what I was interested in is is what if you wanted to get your consensus times down into the sub one second range? Yeah, well, and, and I'd imagine you could probably get down to the sub 100 millisecond range if you wanted to apply some other optimization. So I talked about distribution optimization. If you've got 10 uh, nodes that are regionally close to close to each other, which is how gaming works anyway. When you game, you want to game near, with other people that are near you. Um, and the second one is when you saw um, uh, Swirled State, the default interface, which I said it streams the consensus ones first and then the non-consensus ones after that. Normally, you would ignore the non-consensus ones, but in gaming, you could actually treat those non-consensus transactions as if they were consensus transactions and then use net code to back out of that when those become sources of conflict. So it's just like with net code, uh, they've got the, the lag averaging between the shooter and the person who gets shot, for example. Um, you could do a lot of those types of things where you're just getting, as soon as your node hears about a transaction or an action anywhere on the network, it treats it as if it really did happen, whether it's reached consensus or not, and the only time you fall back on the consensus to validate it is if there's a conflict in netcode and the result, I should say. If there's a conflict in the result, then you, then you fall back on the consensus. So you could even get it down to several hundred milliseconds for the majority of stuff, and then it would spike every once in a while when we had a, a netcode conflict um, for you know maybe 100 milliseconds or, or somewhere in there. Um, but it could be like really, really fast if you have small networks uh, with small transactions. Um, and you're treating non-consensus transactions, and your net code is done right, I should say. If your net code is done right, you can get really, really fast. Uh, which that, to me, is really exciting. Of, you know, Because I was thinking, if you're playing Minecraft with 10 people, everybody could be a node, and that could be pretty fun. And with some net code, we can probably get that down to something usable with Minecraft. But something like, uh, like Fortnite or PUBG, where you've got 100 people on the server, how do you handle 100 people in the network? You couldn't have all of them be consensus nodes because then you just would have you know three, four second latency. That doesn't work in a first person shooter. So that's where we've you know we've done some preliminary work in figuring out how to do that from an architecture perspective and also from an active perspective. Um, there you go. So Ken, um, you know, right before this, uh, you know, I covered about like projects that are beginning to um, you know launch on uh, their hash wrap. Uh, or basically projects you know, starting to uh, come into the ecosystem. You know, with, so right now, the platform is not fully launched, and there's plans to have it, you know, the mainnet up and running by the end of 2018. However, of those projects that I had uh, covered tonight, um, you know, with Carbon, Mingo, and whatnot, um, I guess what's the process for some of those projects to kind of come in through like the early stages? And then I guess, um, where can you, like let's say if you already have an idea for, for a project, or maybe you already have an application up and running, Really want to have it run on, on Hashgraph? Where would like one might go to um, get that started, and what would be the process if they wanted to stand up their, their application, you know, today on, on top of uh, the public ledger? Um, 
Yeah, so there's not much you can do on the public ledger right now, but the best way to go is to register your interest. Um, and in there, there is develop and launch a distributed application. And so that's one of the registration points. I will tell you right now that, um, you know, the, the gentleman earlier talked about, you know, I, I registered my interest to become an investor and, and I didn't hear anything. Uh, each one of these interest categories has a huge uh, list of people that we're watching. And I will tell you that DAPs, developers, um, that's a list that we're watching very closely. And if it's something that is real, so somebody has a real product and a real plan, uh, there's probably a good chance we're gonna get on the phone with them and figure out how that can work. Um, realistically, we're looking about a month to a month and a half before we start letting some of those DAPs access the public network API. So there's all obviously a timing component there. There are a few early adopter partners that supported us really, really early that are getting a little bit earlier access. Um, but I would say that it's probably safer to wait a month to a month and a half just because you're going to have a, a more robust interface and more stable uh, APIs. So maybe said like another way too is, um, you know, so right now this is like a really um, early, early projects that are getting the access, helping you guys kind of uh, play around with the, the test net. But then now all things uh, set aside come the end of 2018 that the, app, I mean, the, uh, the net is uh, entirely launched. Anyone mm -hmm. can gain access, anyone can launch it. No one needs to necessarily go directly through you guys. It's just because it's in testnet phase, that's Correct. why you guys are asking people to come from you guys first. But eventually, exactly. you'll never need to speak with Ken Anderson or George Free or any of those guys, right? Correct. Yep. No, no licensing, no need to register, no nothing. You can just anonymously build apps and deploy them. I'll do it. granted. Our, our biz dev guys like to keep track of who's doing what, so it's, sure. it's valuable from our perspective to know who we can engage with and who we can do cross promotions with. And, and, and I will have to say that you know, Ken Anderson's a really nice guy to, to speak with, so uh, <laughs> just throw that out there. Yeah. All right. Hey, Ken, this is uh, Sherrod. Hey. Um, hey. Hey. So um, my question is for some of us that are not developers, uh, uh, not so Savvy. I remember on the first uh, meetup at uh, Chicago, something that caught my eye was that, that you showed the uh, gossip on gossip. I don't know if you could show that really quick. Sure. That'd be awesome. So we can see how fast it runs and how how the actual gossip 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 <coughs> gossip works. Yeah. So I'm gonna go ahead and close everything that I have open here. Oh, that was the one I probably should have left open. Uh, config.txt. So we are going to turn off hello swirl. Actually, That's okay. um, let's do stats. That's a good one. All right. So now if I come in here and I do go ahead and start up with stats. Here we go. So yeah, this one's a fun one. It's gonna sound like my uh, my computer is about to take off like a jet engine. If you see the transactions per second, even just on my laptop, are over 100,000. It'll it'll peak out at about 200,000 um, as it warms up. If we look here at the graph, though, is this what you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let me change this to 50. Now nah, let's do 100. There we go. We'll do 120. You can see more, more blues in there. And then we will freeze. And can the, yes. the blue is consensus and the green is now? Correct. Yep. The green, so the, the time goes, um, it, you can imagine that the time is the time is flowing up and the nodes are flowing, or the events are flowing down. So the ones at the very top are the newest events that are being reported, and the ones at the bottom are the oldest ones. That are getting voted on. So if you look at how this works, um, you know I, I've had people make the analogy that each node is basically running its own blockchain and synchronizing with every other blockchain. Each node is basically creating these events of all the transactions they learned about and of all the events they've heard about previously. And if you think about it from the perspective of gossip, so if we talk about just gossip, for example, if we talk just about gossip. 
All the gossip is, is you, I have a node, you have a node, and our nodes connect and share some information. Um, that's important. What we're doing here is when I have transactions, I'm constantly reaching out to random nodes that I know that are in the network. And as soon as I connect to one, I'm going to say, hey, here are all the events I know about. And you're going to say, hey, here are all the events I know about. We're going to say, okay, which ones don't we know about from each other? And we're going to exchange those events. So we're going to exchange everything we, we know that the other one doesn't know. And then when we both hang up, we're both going to create a new event commemorating that phone call or that gossip. And that new event has a few parts to it. It's got the timestamp. It's got the payload. It's got um, the parent signatures. And by, when I say multiple parents, if, for example, uh, let me see if I can find it. We'll just use this for example. So this, if you can see my uh, cursor here, hopefully. I'm just kind of arbitrarily pointing at a node. So you'll see this event has a line back to this blue event right here. So basically what I'm saying is I'm including the hash of the last event of the person I just talked to. And I'm also going to include a hash of my last event. So I have two parents. This event has two parents. It's got a parent event on this, on Alice's history, and it's got a parent event on my history. Those two hashes together give me a lot of information. It helps me to build this visual graph that you see here that allows me to track down who knows what. Because if I follow this line and I keep following it back, I can see the person also talked to Dave, and Dave talked to Carol. So I can start to create some, uh, some connections of who knows what in the entire network. This is key. So that gossip about gossip. So gossip would be where gossip being the transaction. The gossip about gossip is saying, how did we learn about those transactions? How did everybody learn about those transactions? And by creating this graph of, of related events, we can now run some algorithms against it and come to conclusions about who knows what at which time. So if we look here, all the blue dots are the ones that um, are consensus. These are consensus events, or events that are finalized with regard to consensus, reached consensus. Green dots have not yet reached consensus. Um, this happens really, really fast. If you think about it right now, the default I think is set to gossip 10 times in a second. Um, these transactions are all, or these events are all grouped into rounds, and it takes about three to four rounds before we come to consensus. Um, and this is what is called virtual voting. Virtual voting is really important. The first step is to divide everything into rounds. The second one is to decide fame, who, has, who is a famous witness. Um, and then the third is to uh, count up all the votes. So that entire process, it is an algorithm that each node runs independently. Now keep in mind, the events at the top aren't going to look the same for every node at all times. At some point, they're all going to converge, and every node will have the exact same copy of the older events. And then they can come to, they can run the algorithm against their local copy of this graph and independently determine consensus. Um, so it's actually a really cool thing that it, it's called virtual voting. You know, in voting, what you would do is everybody would count it up and then broadcast their vote, and then somebody would count up those votes, broadcast the results of the counting. And then if there are any conflicts, they go through that process again. And this, what we're basically saying is everybody talks to each other as fast as they possibly can. And in talking to each other, all the only additional piece they're getting each other is the parent hashes. The self-parent hash and the other parent hash of who they just hung up with. That's the only additional piece of data that is not necessary for a gossip. But that's that piece of data allows us to build the structure and then in memory, run this algorithm, the Hashgraph algorithm, which will determine which events everybody knows are, uh, are at consensus and which order they came in. So it's amazingly powerful. It's, it's a unique approach. And, and this is one of the cool things about the algorithm. Um, I've watched it run in, in huge deployments, 120, uh, 128 node deployment. Um, every node comes to the exact same consensus. And so that's the brilliant part of it. Is, is there's no coordinator, there's no validator, there's nobody in the middle saying this is consensus and everybody has to agree with it. There's no block producer. Everybody's just gossiping what they know, 
receiving what they're finding out from everybody else, and after a short period of time, they can make some calculations on who knows what and what order those events are in. So there's no slowing down to, to solve some computational problem. There's no slowing down to order things or validate things. This all happens on the fly, and you just keep going as fast as you can. And this is why we say that Hashgraph runs almost at the speed of the internet. The only overhead is that those two parent hashes. But that's a very small fraction of an event, depending on how big an event you want to broadcast. So you can say, you know, I want 1,000 transactions per event or 100 transactions per event. Fewer and smaller transactions you have per event, the bigger those eight bytes of hashes is going to look relative. But the bigger events you have, the smaller that becomes. So anyway, I hope that answers your question. But this is basically the graph you see. The, we'll even get a little bit smaller here, or get the dots bigger, I should say. It's a little bit easier to see these relationships when you do this. You see this, this green dot is related to this green dot right here and its parent. So this is how they heard about those events and those transactions. It's a really cool and very elegant algorithm. It's, uh, and it's one of those things where um, if, even if you took down one third of the network, we would still come to consensus. I hope that helps. That's great. Ken, we're going to have to call it right there. We've reached the end of sure. our time. Thank you very much for taking the time and presenting this to us. Yeah, my pleasure. You can tell I, I am very passionate about this. <laughs> so. That's awesome. Happy to talk all day long. <laughs>